Well, my dear friends, let me tell you this much. It's not very often that a story scares the hell out of you while you're reading it, but this is definitely one of those. Oof. On a number of occasions I had to stop and just oof, take a deep breath while I was doing this. So, I hope you're ready. <laughs> well, this is a two-parter again. Um, I will be concluding this story on Wednesday, but I think it's for the best because it's simply too scary for you to listen to all in one go. So, are you ready? Don't worry. I'm metaphorically holding your hand through this one, so don't be too scared. You know what? I think it's time, don't you? Yes. Sit back and relax with your favorite drink because it is time to listen. Growing up, I always feared monsters. Even in college, which most would consider to be the time when you can be called an adult. My greatest fears were the monsters under my bed, in the closet or at the window. I would always tell myself how silly this was, seeing as I was an adult at this point, and I was still afraid of something I knew did not exist. That was until... until I met my wife. But, before I tell you what happened, let me elaborate on how I met my wife-to-be and how much she means to me. I met Natalie in college. I, well, I was a nerdy guy, and yet she saw something in me that no other girl in my life had. She was an extremely kind person, who always had the sweetest of intentions. As I spent more time with her, I realized how many things we had in common. To me, she was the most beautiful girl in the world. I could stare into her green eyes for the rest of my life, and that's what I chose to do when I proposed and we finally got married. Fast forward to married life. I'm working now, while she is working on an online master's degree. Life is good. Life is actually perfect. Too perfect. Ever since we got married, I've told her everything. My deepest secrets, my deepest feelings, and, most importantly, my deepest fears. I remember when I first told her about my silly fear of monsters. <laughs> At first, she just laughed it off. But over time, she noticed how I would sometimes shiver in bed, lying awake in fear. Being the sweetheart that she is, she would hold me and tell me it would be all right. My wife became <laughs> my protector. She became the one to keep my fears in check. Her face became that of an angel to me. One that would protect me from whatever scary things life had in store for me. I came to trust those beautiful green eyes, and every time I saw her, I knew I was safe. Now, to the more weird things that have been happening of late. The first incident that I can recall that could be defined as strange happened at 3am one night. I woke up feeling extremely thirsty, but being the fearful guy that I am, I grabbed the flashlight to get some water. As soon as I turned on the flashlight, I noticed my wife wasn't in bed. I looked over to the bathroom, and the light was on, and I could hear the water running, so I assumed she was there. Half asleep, I walked downstairs to the kitchen, and almost had a heart attack when I saw my wife standing in a corner drinking water. As soon as I saw her, though, I felt safe. She smiled at me, as she sipped the water from the glass. I was too tired, and I mumbled something about how hot it is as I got some water. She continued to smile at me as I finished my water and headed upstairs. As I walked back upstairs, I called out that she should come back to bed, seeing as it's so late. When I got back to my room, there she was, sound asleep. This was the moment I became wide awake. I could have sworn that she was downstairs having water. Afraid to go back downstairs, I woke her up and told her what had happened. Half asleep, half upset, she comforted me and told me to go back to bed. The next morning she joked about how I'm so afraid of the dark that I see her everywhere as my protector. Besides, I was using the bathroom when you thought I was out of bed. She claimed, with that warm smile, how could I think otherwise? 
A week later, another strange incident. This was in broad daylight, well on a Saturday morning. Natalie woke me up at 11am and told me she was going to get groceries. At around half past 11, I finally got out of bed and dressed up for a late brunch with my beautiful wife. I went to the kitchen and found her drinking a glass of water. I smiled and said, Back so soon, honey? She didn't reply. She just smiled as she sipped on her water. Before I could approach her, the doorbell rang and I immediately went to see who it was. I opened the door. Yes, it was my wife, back with all the groceries. Oh, help me with all this, would you? She jokingly snapped as she put down the paper bags by the door. As soon as she saw my colour drained face, she knew something was wrong. She sat me down, got me some water, and I told her what had happened. This time it was in broad daylight, and I knew what I'd seen. As much as I'd come to adore her beautiful green eyes, for the first time I saw in them a strange fear. My wife was the strong one, never afraid. She told me there's something she should have told me a long time ago. She said this happened to her as a kid, a lot. Where her parents and siblings would see her in places they knew she wasn't. They could never explain these occurrences, but seeing as it caused no harm, they came to live with it without really questioning these encounters. It took me a few months to process everything she told me, but I started to live with it too. Like I said, my true perception of fear was monsters, not my beautiful wife. Several similar incidents happened. For instance, I would see her sitting in bed, only to find her cooking in the kitchen downstairs. And in all these instances, when I would interact with this entity that I still saw as my wife, she would smile and not say anything. I actually came to find comfort in seeing my wife all the time. Always smiling, always happy, and always perfect. It is important to note, however, that in all of these incidents, there was never any overlap, meaning I never saw her in two places simultaneously. I guess any sane person would have called out to their wife when they thought they were seeing the entity, but... Like I said, I found comfort in her green eyes, in her smiling face, so honestly, I didn't really care. And then, today, everything changed. My wife told me she was going to visit her grandparents, who live in an hour away from where we do. She invited me to go, but seeing as it was a Sunday, and I just wanted to be lazy, I told her to go ahead without me. This is when it finally happened. The overlap. I was in my living room watching TV when I got up to get myself a Coke. There she was, my wife again, sipping water from a glass and just smiling. I was so used to it by now, knowing that this was the entity. I smiled and said, <laughs> Nice to see you're still watching over me. She smiled and continued to look at me with those beautiful green eyes I'd grown so fond of. That's when the phone rang, and I turned away from the entity to pick it up. I'm going to run a little late since Granny insists on me staying for lunch. It was my wife, and as soon as I heard her voice, I heard a glass shatter, which my wife on the phone also heard. I turned around and saw that the entity was now glaring at me, the smile no longer there, but rather a very disturbing grin. She was pointing at me, with her head tilted at a perfect 90 degree angle. But that wasn't what disturbed me. It was her eyes. They were no longer the green that I'd found so much comfort in. They were pitch black, like those demons in the movies. I stared at her as I was at a complete loss for words. Honey, is everything okay? Did you drop something? My wife asked on the phone. I whispered back into the phone. I didn't. She did. At this point, my wife screamed into the phone. 
Hang up and look away. I don't know how I found the strength to do so, but I did exactly what she said. When I opened my eyes a split second later, she was gone. Confused and scared, I called my wife back, who said she was already on the way. It shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have happened. They said it wouldn't. They said she was harmless. I'm too scared to just sit around and wait. I still keep looking over my shoulder. My wife should be home any time now. As soon as she gets back, I'll ask her who she meant by they, and what the hell is going on. She knows something, and I have to know what it is. Never did I think that the one I hold so near and dear to my heart, the one who protects me, could become the monster that I fear the most. When my wife Natalie got back, she came in crying and wouldn't stop. She kept saying, you, you don't deserve this, we don't deserve this. You weren't supposed to overlap. I love you, I care about you, your family. Oh, you shouldn't have overlapped. At this point I was really confused. I comforted her, held her until she stopped crying. Then, when she finally settled, I asked, Love, you're not making any sense. Who is she? Are you referring to the entity? She told me that she doesn't have a name for it, and she's never actually seen her. Only others around her can see her sometimes, but she has always been described as someone who looks just like her. The same radiant smile, and the same lovely green eyes. But when you screamed in the phone earlier, you knew that what I was seeing was... <laughs> you knew, didn't you? How? She looked at me and started crying again. Oh God, I only kept it from you because I didn't want you to freak out, she said. It's all right, just tell me everything, I replied, pulling her close. Then she told me the story of the last person who overlapped meaning the one who saw her and the entity at the same time. When Natalie was in high school, her family, namely her parents and two brothers, were used to seeing it, well, as I call it for lack of better word, they were used to seeing it around the house. She was always described as a smiling girl who would usually just be sipping on water. This occurrence only seemed to happen in her house, never at school or outside. Her parents, knowing the situation, would never allow her to bring any friends over for fear that they might freak out when, for fear that they might freak out at what they see. But one day, upon her insistence, and arguing that seeing it has never done anyone harm, her parents let her bring over a friend. Natalie and her friend Chris were working on some homework when Natalie decided to go down to the kitchen and grab some snacks. While she was coming back up, she heard Chris saying, very funny, but you're weirding me out with that smile. Natalie stopped dead in her tracks, but it was too late. The door to her room was open, and she was in direct line of sight of Chris in the hallway. He turned to look at her, his face completely pale, as Natalie heard glass shattering. She was completely in shock. Chris was looking at them simultaneously. Staring wide-eyed in the corner of the room, she heard him say, What in the... Natalie ran towards her room, but the door suddenly slammed shut. She started banging on the door. Chris, don't look at her, just don't! She screamed across the door. But, silence. The door opened five minutes later, and she found him unconscious. After taking him to the hospital, they found out that Chris had gone blind. The doctors couldn't explain it. And when they asked Chris to describe the last thing he saw, he struggled for words. That, that grin. The, those eyes. Black. Black eyes. And her head, oh God, her head was tilted 90 degrees. I never thought such a beautiful face could be so twisted. She thinks the only reason I can still see is because the overlap happened over the phone. 
so I wasn't able to feel the full effect, whatever that means. I was surprised that another overlap like this hadn't occurred throughout her life. And that's when Natalie told me that they said she was harmless, and they will not actively try to overlap. So then, I inquired about the they that she just mentioned. Well, when I was a kid, my grandparents knew something about this. They were all very hush-hush about it, but apparently it had happened in the family once before. So it was clear then. We needed to go and see her great-grandmother, who was the only one left that could provide us with any answers. Natalie called her mum, and was told that they hadn't been in contact with their great-grandmother for the past two years. Ever since her husband died, she'd become depressed and had asked not to be contacted, and broke off all ties. She lived out in the country by herself, secluded from the rest of the world. It was going to be a three-hour drive, so we decided to attempt to get some rest in before our drive the next day. We barely got a few hours of sleep in. My wife woke me up this morning, telling me, Breakfast ready? as she walked downstairs. I noticed both of us must have missed our alarms, because it was 11am already. The first thing I checked when I woke up was the bed to make sure I wasn't seeing it. When I finally went downstairs, I nearly fell backwards when I saw my wife, sipping from a glass of orange juice, facing the kitchen entrance. Jeez, don't do that, I snapped. She came rushing towards me. Oh, sorry, she mumbled. I walked over and gave her a big hug. God, it's alright, we're both on edge. We'll work through this. After a breakfast that neither of us had the appetite for, we hit the road to find some answers. As we were driving, my wife held my hand, and I felt safe once again. It was a strange sense of security, because even after the crazy events, it was bright and sunny outside, and I was just peacefully driving away with my wife. She smiled at me. I smiled back, looking at her beautiful green eyes while fighting internally to take the image of the twisted entity off of my mind. We remained quiet for most of our journey, until we finally reached the house. The house was located deep off of a small highway, on a narrow dirt road. There was an old van parked, but it didn't look like it had been driven for weeks. The house also looked like it had been abandoned for a while. My wife reached out and I held her hand. Let's hope for the best and see what we find, I said. But before I could open the door, my cell phone rang. The moment the first ringing sound broke the quiet air, my wife clutched my hand just a bit tighter. She was on edge, I could tell. I looked over at her and she was smiling ever so slightly. I pulled out my phone, looked at the caller ID. It read, Natalie. The grip of the hand that I was holding started getting tighter and tighter. I suddenly got the feeling I was not with my wife at all. Call it a gut feeling. I picked up the phone as I realized the person in my peripheral vision was changing their expression. The breathing also got heavier as I heard the neck starting to turn. With what little bravery I had left, I turned away, not daring to see that twisted face. It's not me, Natalie yelled from the phone. The instant her voice reached my ear, I felt the glass shattering sound in a burning pain on my hand that lasted for a split second. I recoiled in pain, responding, I know, God, I, th I think he's gone now. I looked over to see, and sure enough, she wasn't there anymore. I breathed. Don't hang up and drive over here. We need to see this thing through. On her drive over, she explained how, when she woke up, she was seemingly stuffed under the bed, as if someone had knocked her out and slid her under there. When she woke up and realized that I wasn't there, 
She knew something was up and called immediately. At this point, I was freaking out a lot. So many questions rushed to mind. It talked. It acted just like my wife. How was it holding my hand? How in the world did it get out of the house? Most importantly, how do I tell it apart from my wife? That's when I remembered the stinging pain and looked at my hand. There was a very clear, lucky, burn into my hand. While I waited for my wife to drive over, I started thinking. The entity said, breakfast ready, and sorry. And why in the world was it sipping orange juice? Is it evolving? Is it learning how to fool me? I wondered for a long time what all this meant until my wife finally arrived at 5 p.m. It was getting dark and I wanted to go to a motel and come back tomorrow. But my wife insisted that we at least check out to see if someone lives in the abandoned house. Before she got out of the car though, she took the cigarette lighter from her car and burned it on her hand. I got very upset when she did that, but she said it might help me tell them apart. At this point, any idea of rationalizing this fear sounded great. We went and knocked on the door as the doorbell seemed broken. Oh, did you hear that? My wife looked at me, terrified. Hear what? I wondered. The scream. It sounds like someone is in pain. My instinct was to back out, and I really wish I had. But before I could do anything, my wife was opening the door, leading me in. I held her hand, while keeping one foot in the door. I was all too familiar with the classic door slams behind you in a creepy house to walk in completely. Inside, everything was dusty and full of webs. It was also unnervingly dark. As my eyes adjusted to the dark, I noticed that the house was completely trashed, with strange symbols scratched into the walls and on the broken furniture in a shade of red. Just then, my wife started feeling lightheaded and began to fall. Oh, I feel so dizzy, she mumbled. I immediately caught her as she passed out. Then, to my horror, as I looked up, I saw her in the hallway. I could barely make out her figure, but her finger was pointed at me, with her head tilted at that unnatural angle. I did not need to stand there until I saw the rest of her creepy figure. I immediately turned round while dragging my wife with me. The door behind us slammed shut, but luckily my foot was in the door. I groaned in pain from the impact and lunged towards the barely open door and crashed outside with my wife. I looked back, wishing she was gone, but she was still walking towards us, very slowly, very deliberately. The next moments were kind of hazy as I was full of adrenaline. I somehow managed to throw my wife in the car and get in. As I looked in my rearview mirror, I saw her. Her mouth was now wide open, and she screamed. As I hit the accelerator, I heard what sounded like the windows of the house smashing. I drove for half an hour to a small motel to rent a room for the night. At this point, my wife is asleep, but I haven't slept at all. I dare not look away from her. And what does the message on my hand mean? Is it toying with me? Telling me I'm lucky my wife called to save me? Should I go into the house again with someone else? When my wife woke up, we had a long discussion on what our next step should be. While we were talking, I casually glanced at her wrist and noticed the burn mark was still there. She saw me looking, and her usual radiant green eyes became dull. It's me. I wish I could tell you not to be afraid of me, but I don't even trust myself anymore. Tears started running down her face as I gave her a hug and comforted her without responding. 
She was right. I was starting to doubt the one person I trusted to protect me in any situation. Though I took some solace in the fact that she was still the one who saved me twice from the twisted entity. Besides doubting ourselves, we came up with a few theories that seemed to make sense in light of recent events. First, it seems that the entity is unable to appear in my wife's presence, proven by the fact that the moment she passed out, I was able to see it. Second, the entity is either evolving, since it was able to speak and move out of the house, or there might be multiple entities, as some of you have suggested. Third, technology could potentially be a weakness for this thing, as the phone call has saved me twice now. And finally, there's something very wrong with that house, and the entity definitely doesn't want us there. The house is something that has to be explored. But it's too dangerous to just go back without any further knowledge. So, we decided to talk with the only other person in Natalie's life who had experienced the overlap. Her high school friend, Chris. After making some phone calls, we found out that Chris lived in a nearby town and had become a support group speaker for the visually impaired. It turned out he was actually speaking at 11am, and we still had enough time to be able to make it. We got to the small community hall just in time as they closed the doors. Most of Chris's speech was very uplifting and full of emotion, talking about all he had achieved in life. He ended his speech by saying, The day that I lost my vision was the day that I truly stopped living in fear. We stuck around after, and when the hall had emptied, we approached Chris, who was standing next to his wife, whom he had introduced earlier during his speech. I didn't know how to even begin to ask him about his vision loss. But before I could say anything, he pointed to me. Ah, so the overlap happened. She said you would come. He then went on to tell us that ever since the incident, Natalie's great-grandmother had been in close touch with Chris. She felt very guilty about what had happened and was determined to find as much as she could. She also insisted that it was only a matter of time before the overlap happened again around Natalie, and she wanted to find a way to stop it. When we told Chris about the condition of the house and about the symbols that I'd seen, he became very serious. <sighs> then she tried to do it. She tried to bind what holds the sisters together to her house. I'm afraid she may not have survived that, he said quietly. I was really confused at this point. Did you just say sisters? I asked. Chris then told us to follow him home, as there was a lot we needed to discuss. While Chris's wife cooked us lunch, he told us about the day he'd lost his vision. So, I never told this to anyone except your great-grandmother. But that day that I lost my vision, before I passed out, I'm pretty certain I saw a second entity behind the one that I was staring at in disbelief. And as I drifted into unconsciousness, I heard a whisper. Feed. He went on to explain that Natalie's great-grandmother called the entity sisters, since she was certain there was more than one of them. Additionally, she believed that they feed off of our fears. And not just fear, but the greater the fear, the more attracted the entity becomes. This made sense, seeing as I've been afraid most of my life, and now I'm at the peak of my fear since the one that I saw as my protector has become the subject of my fear. After years of research into ancient lore, demonology, mythology and family history, Natalie's great-grandmother found a way to pin the sisters. That has to be why there were strange symbols in the house, and why the sisters didn't want us going near the place. She must have found a way to bind them there. However, seeing as the entity still appeared and drove with me in the car, that means they are still able to move freely. But they might have a vulnerability in that house. All of this was progress. Yet the thought of not knowing how to deal with these sisters was quite troubling. Lunch is ready, called out Chris's wife, as we made our way to the kitchen to enjoy a much-needed meal. Chris wanted this to end as much as we did, 
so he insisted that we spend the night with him for our safety. Considering I hadn't gotten any sleep lately, I welcomed the idea. We all stayed in the living room, and Chris's wife and I took shifts staying up to make sure nothing happened. I woke up at 3am, feeling thirsty yet again. I laughed at myself, as I thought maybe I have a medical condition of waking up thirsty in the middle of the night. I looked over at Chris's wife, since it was her shift to be on watch. Sure enough, she was awake and looking over at me with a gentle smile. I whispered, Water? As she pointed to the kitchen. I walked over, half in fear of seeing the entity again. The kitchen was, thankfully, empty, as I went to look for water in the fridge. <sighs> no cold water in the fridge. I figure they might have some bottled water in the pantry. When I opened the pantry, I saw that it was very spacious and dark. I went to turn on the light and saw something very unexpected and horrific. In the corner lay Chris's wife, tied up, seemingly unconscious. Then it all hit me. Lunch is ready. Those were the only words spoken by Chris's wife that day. I was so caught up in figuring out what was chasing us that I missed that fact completely. I rushed back to the living room to find my wife missing and Chris sound asleep. What ensued after is beyond bizarre. I woke up Chris and called the cops immediately. I knew they must have taken her to the house. I didn't have time to tell them my wife was missing, so I rushed out of the door and headed for the house. Yes, I know this was very stupid, but we do stupid things when our loved ones are in danger. It's just human nature. During the drive, I kept asking myself, how did I miss that? Why is the entity evolving so fast? God, it took another form. Is it because I wasn't supposed to survive an overlap, much less twice? Jeez, is it hunting me down? But why take my wife? I'm the one they want. I finally reached the house. It was now six o'clock in the morning. Before I could step outside my car, my phone rang. It was Natalie. Hello? Honey, are you okay? Where are you? I yelled as I picked up. Oh, I'm, I'm so confused. I thought we slept at Chris's house. I'm home. I'm home, please, just come back. Oh, now I was really confused. Is that still my wife on the phone? Honey, your wrist. Before I could finish, she replied, Yes, there is still a burn mark on my wrist. And so, I decided to drive back. As I started reversing, I saw it. Standing in the window of that decrepit house, sipping water from a glass, smiling at me with eyes shining greener than usual. I left for home, frustrated and not understanding any of what was going on. On my drive back, I wondered. It knew I was going back to the house to look for my wife. It wanted to see me, but why? When I got home, Natalie came running and gave me a hug. I felt cold-hearted for doing this, but I immediately pulled out her wrist to find the burn mark on it. She looked up at me in disappointment. It is me. As I finally looked into her eyes, my heart stopped. Her eyes, they were dark black. The iris of her eye was no longer the beautiful green that I had come to find comfort in. They were deep black. Natalie has been crying a lot ever since she looked in the mirror, and I'm still processing all of what's just happened. It's been a complete day since her eyes changed colour, and there have been no more sightings of the entity. Life is seemingly normal. Not perfect anymore, but normal. Natalie is still herself, but seems to be a lot more of a serious person now. I spoke with Chris on the phone, 
and he told me that him and his wife were doing okay and haven't seen the entity since. At this point, I'm writing this update and, well, I'm not sure if I should go back to the house and investigate. But I can't help but think it wanted me to see its eyes that day at the house. It wanted me to know what it had taken from me. I don't even know if destroying the sisters will bring back Natalie's beautiful green eyes. With that said, I'm keeping a close eye on her. What did you think of that one? Well, that's an award-winning story from No Sleep from back in 2015. I think it's only been recorded once before, so the chances are you haven't heard that one before. Oh, dear, I tell you, a few times I had to stop and, you know, just uh, gather my thoughts while I was doing that one. Pretty darn scary. Well, join me again on Wednesday for the conclusion of this story. You will, won't you? Go on, say you will. There you go. All right, back again with you on Wednesday. But until then, you have sweet dreams and remember it's just a story. I'll be back again with you soon, okay? But for now, bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>